Speech anxiety is not at right. all uncommon. In fact, it's probably the single most important or single biggest reason why this class even exists, why I teach an introductory public speaking class, because a lot of people report a fear of public speaking. In fact, in a 2005 survey, 42% of people in the United States listed public speaking as their greatest fear. And number two was the fear of death. That means that more people are afraid of getting up in front of a crowd and talking than they are of actually dying. And that in itself kind of represents this huge stigma that public speaking has in a lot of our minds. Public speaking dominates a lot of our thoughts. It dominates a lot of our fears. We've all had at least one nightmare regarding public speaking. So what this chapter is going to do is this chapter is going to have us address what speech anxiety actually is, some effective strategies we can use to help address it, and some unique perspectives we can take to actually see speech anxiety or more the feeling that it gives us in a more positive, constructive light. But I would like to go ahead and get started with a question of the day. The question of the day today, well, actually, you're going to get two questions of the day. One of the questions of the day is, if you could relive one day or moment in your life, what would it, be, what would it be and why? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to split you off into two, three breakout rooms. You're going to just meet up with a couple of your classmates. You're going to talk about the discussion question. So if you could relive any day of your life, which day would it be and why? Go ahead. Okay. I'm, going to, I'm creating breakout rooms. And... Actually, yeah, I'll pair you. I'll pair you off into pairs. So, breakout rooms are open. Go ahead and join. Coming on back to it. So, now that we talked about what special day we'd like to relive, I'd like to ask another question to you all, which is: Think back to when you were a kid. Think about what scared you as a kid. So. Let's go ahead and let's share some childhood fears. What were you scared of as a kid? Anybody? Me. <laughs> Always me. What was that, Lou? Yes. Oh. Um, I was scared of mice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, oh, until no. now, you want me to die? You just show me a mice and I'll well, be, I will get a... a heart attack and I'm gone. <laughs> no, I mean, that, and that answers my second question, right? Are you still afraid of it now? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anything small that's, that crawls, no way. I do not handle no, at all. Anything with hairy and fa family of ma mice, mouse, uh-uh. I am oh, not yeah. going there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, especially because one time I saw, one time I saw a rat crawling on top of my sink. Oh and my God. I think I screamed so loud, I might have actually cracked the window. So, yeah, <laughs> no, I don't deal with any of that. Okay. Anyone else? Any other childhood fears we'd like to share? Um, I was afraid of strangers. And I wonder why, right? It's only like that stranger danger is hammered into us every single second of the day as kids, right? We watch ads about it. Our parents warn us about it. All kinds of things, right? To the point where we don't even know what a stranger really is at that point, right? Or why we should be scared of them. We're just terrified of them. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And are you still scared of strangers, Deja? Yes, I have really that <laughs> so, fear of the unknown is still a very... People are very much so, right? <laughs> sorry to keep interrupting you but that fear of the unknown right it's a very powerful force it again i feel like we all encounter it on some point if we're all walking down a dark street and someone's following us we're always going to get a little bit of that chill to the back of our neck right okay mm -hmm. any other childhood fears slender man <laughs> when was i i was in high school when slender man came out and wow yeah that really got to me especially when you watch Especially when I, don't know, I was like, I mean, I was a, I was what, 15, 16, watching YouTube videos on it and still absolutely spazzing out when I saw it, when, when I saw people playing it. Oh, wow. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, never, never, never. Like never. Hi hiding in closets and stuff, man. It was, it was pretty scary. My brother would scare me all the, it would scare me all the time. Oh, He's telling totally. me stories. You come in, you know, we would come in after 12. <laughs> so like he may 
you gotta make sure doors are closed you know lights are on oh no totally no (laughs) what's funny to me is i was so i was scared of it like 12 years ago right but they came up with a movie about it like three years ago so really hitting when that so really striking when that was in full force right only like eight years after everyone's forgotten about it anna did you have your hand up um, yeah, but not anymore because I had the same uh, fear. Slenderman? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, right? It spread pretty far. Okay. Are we still afraid of Slenderman? I am not. No, not anymore. Okay. Well, then that transitions to my last question, which is, think of all these childhood fears, and let's ask, how did you overcome those fears, right? So, what was the way that you finally managed to move past that fear? What was that? What was a strategy you might have used in the past to let you move past it. And I'm just kind of repeating myself at that point. But how did we overcome those childhood fears? We grow really? up. That's true. We grow up. We find out that there's nothing really living under the bed, that there's really nothing in the dark, that Slender Man can't get to us because we closed all the doors before midnight, right? That kind right. Of thing. Okay. What is the I strategy? mean, unless, unless you're Michael Myers, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's never gone, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's never gone because they'll just reboot the movies as soon as you forget about them. Yeah. Okay. What are some other strategies you might have used to overcome our childhood fears? Um, I used to be afraid of drowning, even though I knew how to swim. It still freaked me out because I had a Hispanic mother, so they just throw you in the pool sometimes. So um, I think just growing like more confidence and like telling myself that it's okay because I know how to swim, I guess. Exactly, because you say grow more confident, and the way you grow more confident is by continuing to swim, right? You don't just sit there and just hope that one day you'll finally get over it. It's as you get more and more familiar with it, eventually it doesn't seem so intimidating to you, right? Although I can mm-hmm. totally relate to that whole throw in the deep end kind of mentality. All right, so that leads me to, well, the most common phobias in the United States organized by this graph. Now, this is a bit outdated. It's about six or so years, but public speaking is still number one. Anyone afraid of heights? Anyone afraid of a fear I of am. heights? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. I, I still can, am. Oof, yeah. I can barely even. Even if, even if I'm like one floor up and I see the ground, I like my heart just starts racing. Mm, very much so. That's yeah. not agoraphobia. That's fear of the outdoors. But yeah, yeah. no. If I if I can't I can't really stand on the roof of any kind of building whatsoever. Me too, yeah, no. yeah. Okay. I'm not af- I'm not afraid of heights, but I'm afraid of going in a super, you know, super tall building, tall building or something. Yeah. yeah. I can fly airplanes cuz you know, I I got my license and everything, and I can fly planes, but I mean, if I can go to New York and go to an Empire State uh, to the la- very last floor, I I just can't. Oh yeah, no, cuz when you see it and it just kind of zooms down, oh no, 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 <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. Well, Lou kind of answered this, but is anyone here afraid of bugs, snakes, or other animals? For sure, bugs. Oh, yeah. Ooh, maggots. Oh, yeah. oh holy shit. Maggots oh, are disgusting. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I found maggots in my, I found maggots in my loaf of bread last week. I was absolutely traumatized. I just wanted toast and, oh, no. Oh, God. I don't, I've never even, or weevils or whatever they're called. Oh, ugh. Ugh. Okay. Well, I think it was Stephanie who answered this, but is anyone afraid of drowning? No. Um, I am. I am. Very much so, right? Mm-hmm. Anyone here afraid of blood or needles? Very much so. No. Me. Needles, no. needles, never, needles never. never. My, Don't that's even, my can't. worst fear next to my sister. Oh, yeah. I can't even look. Oh, no. And then they, oh, and, oof. All Every right. time the, the bottom is give me I need a blood drawn, I will tell her or him, don't hurt me or I'm gonna scream. <laughs> <laughs> they have to hold my hand. Yeah, keep them accountable, Lou. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. Well, as you can see, a lot of other common fears, right? As we saw we saw a lot, we saw strangers, like we talked about earlier. Is anyone here afraid of zombies? Anyone have zo- this was in, again this was in 2014 when everything was zombies when there were zombie movies and- uh, and- uh, it's not true <laughs> yeah right you never know you never know you still never know right <laughs> yeah. anyone afraid of the dark nope not me 
Anyone afraid of clowns? Remember back, like, I mean, this was published back when there were killer clowns just roaming the streets. <laughs> like, like Pennywise or what? Yeah. No, this was before Pennywise. People, it, it, people would just dress up like clowns and jump out of bushes to scare the crap out of you. I have no idea why, but they just got their kicks out of it. Okay. Well, all of these are not real, and yet they're in the top 15 fears in the United States. So as you can see, what we're, uh, what we're afraid of isn't really something that can actually have an effect on us. I don't really think I can, I don't really think I need to worry about zombies or clowns in the immediate future, right? Well, let's be honest. Who here has ever had or currently has a fear of public speaking? I did. Me. I had an anxiety attack in fifth grade when I tried to do my stand-up routine mm. for my elementary school talent show. And yeah, back in the... Go ahead. Go ahead, Professor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, go ahead. You're supposed to interrupt me. I talked to you. I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I kind of had a problem with public speaking back in the day. Not anymore. Not so much anymore. Because, you know, I, I became a trainer. You know, I had to do presentations, you know, went to school and all that. So that helped to, you know, kind of overcome my fear. But before in high school and all that, oh, my God, it was the worst thing. Especially because in high school, they don't really teach you how to public speak. They don't really give you an opportunity to do so. They just kind of say, okay, and it's, and you have to give a presentation and it's due on the fourth and go ahead, right? And the only right. experience you have is just kind of clicking through a PowerPoint, right? That's why my right. high school students are always so, are always so terrified when they take my class. For their first speech, they're like a deer in the headlights. Okay, so. As we saw, most common fears. Now I'd like to take it to a more positive angle. What's something you like to do that really thrills you or excites you, but scares other people? What's something you really like to do that other people might be a little bit intimidated by or afraid of? Flying. Flying, very much so. I really couldn't imagine, I mean, I can barely drive, much less actually fly a plane, right? So that would definitely freak me out. But I feel like, again, Sounds like a really fun thing to do. Fantastic accomplishment to get your pilot's license, right? And right. you just really like it. Yeah, uh, well, it can, it, it can kind of get scary with certain, you know, maneuvers and everything you do. For, of course, like if you're doing a part off stall or a part on stall where you turn off your engine in the air, you're kind of going to get scared for the first, you know, few attempts. But after that, you know, it just becomes a second nature. But uh, yeah, in the beginning when you have to, to you know, land, or take off when you're on, or talk to uh, ATC. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's like anything, man. Like if you really like study and learn, you have no problem. Yeah. Again, practice, right? Anyone else? Right. Anything else? Anyone else do something that might scare other people or might put other people off? I think uh, dancing on the public. I'm not scared to do that. There, you, there she goes. Yeah, exactly. Right. I. I'm terrified to dance in public until oh. I get a couple drinks in me, at which oh, no. point oh, I absolutely make a complete fool out of myself. For my brother's wedding, uh, my uncle just kind of kept giving me whiskey, and by the end of the night, I don't think anyone could even look me in the eye at that point, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they got it on camera, right? <laughs> Oh, let's hope uh, not. Let's hope I've destroyed they all. They got it on camera. I've destroyed all copies. Let's hope <laughs> I got them all, right? Okay. <laughs> Anna, do you have your hand up? Um, yeah, I love roller coasters. Yep, so does my <laughs> friend. She took, me to, she took me to Six Flags uh, in December, and wow, I was really not having it. <laughs> I love Six Flags. I love going Six Flags. Yeah, okay. Becky? Okay, so um, I, I got to work at a veterinary hospital that specializes in reptiles. And I actually really like working with the snakes and the lizards and everything. They're really cool to work with. A lot of people get kind of freaked out by the idea of handling those kinds of animals. But it's a lot of fun. Exactly, right? I mean, again, I'm sure a ton of people would be absolutely horrified of holding a snake. But I love snakes. Oh, my friend has this enormous boa constrictor. He loves to cuddle. That's my joke for the day. Okay. Aww. So, Stephanie? So I know it was mentioned um, earlier by some of you guys that you guys don't like needles and stuff like that. So actually, um, I'm outside of school, I'm a medic. So every time I do like medical uh, emergency medicine, um, I love to do to deal with like the traumas or anything that comes in, especially that has to like that involves like blood and like anything or like surgery wise. 
um, I don't know. I don't know if that thrills me. That gives me a lot of adrenaline and the fact of helping other people as well. Exactly, right? To you, it, I mean, it's just part of the job. And at the same time, it's an act of service, which makes you feel good, right? So I, for example, can barely even look at needles. But when that's the way that you help people, you can already see the shift of perspective there. All right. Thank you all. Well, we all know what it's like to feel nervous, right? Hands clammy, sweaty, heart rate goes up a little bit, that kind of thing, right? Voice guy get a little bit jittery. You might get that jerky knee, wobbly knees, that kind of thing, right? Okay. So, but let me ask you this. What does it feel like when you feel excited physically? Don't think so much about what you're thinking, but what does it physically feel like to be excited for something? Uh, Can't stop talking. Can't stop talking. Okay. I, I feel like I'm on top of the world. <laughs> okay. All right. Mentally. That, that's mental. But what, is a, what, what does it physically feel like? Like, how, do, how does it physically feel to be excited? It's like you want to get to your destination fast. Yeah. Okay. The so, kid. like, you physically run towards it. Or more like, or also like that sense of like time moves a little bit slower, right? Yeah. That yeah. kid on Christmas Eve effect. Like you just want the next day to be here right now, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. How else does it feel? Yeah, I think on my birthday when it's coming, I feel like, oh my God, three more hours. Oh my God, <laughs> two more hours. And then, and then the next thing I know, oh yeah, thank you. It's my birthday now. <laughs> Yeah, those hours feel like days. Okay. Uh huh. Anyone else get a little bit sweaty when they get excited? A little bit of clammy I hands. I do. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else's yeah. heart rate goes up a little bit? A little like bit. I don't drips. I don't drip sweat, but I kind of get sweaty. Like, yeah, you feel a little bit on the back yeah. of the neck, maybe like on, on the forehead, right. right? That kind of thing. Okay. Anyone else feel a little bit shaky knee? Anyone else feel like they can't like if they got a lot of energy that they can't really get out? Maybe shake your hand a little bit. Yeah, you can say that. Okay. Well, like we talked about, I have like a sweaty palms when I get excited, right? I remember when I was, at, I remember when I asked a girl out in high school and my hands were pretty much dripping with sweat on the way over. And a lot of us do get a little bit of that racing heart, right? That's what makes us a little bit eager to want to get to, to want to get to the thing we're excited for. That's the bump, 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 bump. It's wants wanting to run to it. A little, we get a little bit sweaty too. I get a little bit sweaty at the back of the neck, a little bit on the brow. I got a little bit sweaty when I was lecturing to y'all on Monday, first time meeting y'all, a little bit intimidating for me, but hopefully I got over it. A little bit of the shaking knees, a little bit of the noodle legs, right? Feels a little bit awkward to walk. It's a little bit like we can fall over at any moment because we're just so hyped for it. So can anyone now tell me what does it feel like when you are nervous for something? or when you're anxious about something, physically? What does it physically Sha feel like? Shaky. Shaky? A little bit, maybe, yeah. sh maybe shaky ha maybe shaky hands or shaky legs? I like like the, nails. right, right. A little bit of like, yeah, that too. Uh, I what think my, my heartbeat uh, goes like, instead of uh, 50, 50 per, it goes like 150. <laughs> okay. Again, heart rate increase. Okay, yeah. we got that listed here. All right, what else? What else does it feel like to be anxious or to be to be anxious or nervous? I get like nauseous when I'm nervous. A little bit of butterflies in the stomach, right? Anyone here, yeah. ever, get, anyone here ever get butterflies in the stomach when they're excited for something? I do, but in, I also get it when I'm, you know, nervous as well. well I think the same time... I think the symptoms are very, very similar from, you know, from being excited to. And that's my exact point, right? Everything we listed here, we could also say what happens when we feel nervous, right? Physically, right. it's the same. The sweaty palms, the racing heart, the, the whatever, right? So my question is, why do we say we feel nervous when it feels physically identical to being excited for something? or to want to do something. Physically, they're the exact same. It's just your body sending a chemical that just has a response, right? Your body doesn't know fight or flight. It doesn't know if you want to run to it or run away from it. So physically, it's the exact same sensations. The only real difference is how we perceive it. 
When we're nervous about something, we don't want it to happen. We don't want it to come to us. When we're excited for something, we want to get to it as fast as possible. It's a mental shift, but you can see that all of those symptoms of being nervous are the same as excitement. And the key to good public speaking is to be excited about it, is to sound passionate. Your audience will perceive that in you. They'll see that you're excited about something, that you can't wait to talk about it. That's what makes good speeches great, when the speaker is passionate about it. So a key element of speech anxiety is that everything you might feel before a speech, the sweaty palms, the shaking knees, the sweat, all of that you can use to your benefit because that's just your body saying, okay, we're prepped, we're ready, let's do this thing. Rather than being afraid, we can hype ourselves up. We can use that energy for a positive benefit because I can guarantee you that someone is much more likely to listen to your speech if you sound excited for it than if you sound like my high schoolers deliver their speech where they just stare into the camera a little bit at this angle and they go, Hi everyone, today I'm here to talk about why you should recycle. Uh, recycling is, oh wait, hold on. Yeah, okay, recycling is... That's good. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I heard about 18 of those last semester, but what keeps the audience engaged is your energy, is your enthusiasm. That enthusiasm can come from just a physical response use it and harness it towards a positive end. To be anxious is natural. Everyone feels anxious before any kind of event. It's a social thing. It stems back all the way from when we were just hunter gatherers on the plains of Africa. When we didn't know, when we needed to just stay low in the grass and to poke our heads out was to invite a predator coming to eat us. It's that evolved response of saying, okay, don't stick your head out. Don't be the center of attention. But at the same time, it's giving you that energy. It's giving you that drive, that push that can really give your speech that life and energy. I've said energy like five times. Mm -hmm. So here are just some tips of handling your excitement, not your anxiety before speech day. It's just in how we reframe certain things. It's how we re it's how we, word it how we perceive it because so rather than saying okay the key to speech anxiety is to just cancel it out entirely is to never feel anxious to somehow stop your palms from getting sweaty to stop your words from tumbling out instead we can do you can use tips that can help direct that energy that can help use it to still deliver a coherent logical speech so some tips you can use well First, you can record yourself. That's obviously how you're going to be submitting all your activities and assignments. But the great part about recording your speech is that now you can watch it as many times as you like. You can watch it and re-record it. You can practice. You can record, notice whatever kind of patterns, whatever kind of bad habits you might have, and then try it again. I don't have that luxury here. I just kind of have to give you the speech. I just have to give you the lecture. That's why every time that I upload my videos to YouTube, I'm cringing at every time that I trip over my words or repeat my point over and over again. But you can just keep doing it. You can just keep practicing. The more you practice, the more familiar you get with that content and the less intimidating it's going to be. You can also practice your speech without presentation aids. So I try to give this lecture from memory as best as I can without my PowerPoints. I only really use my PowerPoints when I'm actually in the Zoom session. But I practice my lectures to get familiar enough with the content. I try to tell myself, okay, so I talk about the difference between anxiety and excitement. I talk about tips for handling excitement itself. And let's see if I can add any kind of rhetorical questions throughout. Because if I keep relying off the presentation aid, if anything goes wrong or if I lose my place, it could trip me up a little bit. And that could build up onto that energy, that anxiousness, ang anxiousness, anxiety. And I'd also recommend practicing your speech in front of an audience. Now, practicing your speech in front of an audience, as you might know, is a completely different experience towards just talking to yourself in front of a camera. Practice your speech in front of your family members, in front of your friends. 
ordinarily, I would say to try to find an audience that you're unfamiliar with, people you're not necessarily comfortable talking to about everything or comfortable delivering a speech in front of. Because by practicing your speech in front of an audience, you simulate the feeling of actually speaking in public. And now the audience can give you some pointers. They can tell you what they liked about your speech. They can tell you what you can improve for the future, how they, how they would recommend changing it, and so on. All of these get you more and more familiar with the content so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming when you actually give your speech on speech day. And some tips to actually reframe anxiety to excitement is that self-talk. How we speak to ourselves helps reframe every element of how we perceive the actual act of public speaking. Don't think of, it in, don't think of every activity or assignment as I'm going to fail it or I'm trying not to fail it. Think of it in terms of you've already succeeded. You already delivered the amazing speech. You've already got the great grade. You've already got an A in the course. All you have to do now is you have to do the steps that it takes to get that A. It's like saying, rather, if I want to drive, if I want to make a road trip across the country to New York City, I don't say I'm trying not to lose my way across the country. I'm trying to say, I want to get to New York City. All I'm going to do is drive the roads, drive across the states, and I know I'll get there. And it's that simple. Because by speaking success to yourself, by already framing it as I've already done this, here's just what I need to do to make sure of it, you can all, you take that pressure off of yourself. You stop seeing things as mistakes and you start thinking, I got this far, how much further can I go? Some tips you can actually have when delivering your speech is first, I like to laugh. I like to use humor both before, during, and after my speeches because humor is my way of coping with any kind of awkward feeling you might be having. If I'm laughing and if I get the audience laughing with me, that helps relieve some of that tension. That helps break that barrier. I also like listening to some music before my speech just to maybe kind of put me in a more serene state of mind, maybe to hype myself up. It's just like working out, right? Music can help take us out of our own thoughts and put us in a more positive headspace. I also recommend bringing some water because no one likes dry mouth during a speech, especially if we're excited for something. Now, sometimes you'll hear me take a loud, ugly slurp of my water bottle. That's just because, again, I get dry mouth, I get a little bit out of breath, same as all of you. It's natural. So, and to my last point, a very effective strategy is just breathing. Just taking that breath, even if it's during your speech. The audience isn't going anywhere. The audience isn't gonna notice if you just take a five second breath, get your bearings, start your sentence, and continue from there. You control the flow of your speech. You can start and stop it as many times as you like. By just taking that breath whenever you feel you might need it, it can really give you a sense of control, a sense of this is my speech and I'm the speaker. But I've talked a lot. What are some strategies you've used to help address a public a speech anxiety or fear of public speaking that I didn't mention? Anybody? Anyone have any successful strategies or tips for helping with speech anxiety? All right, some people raised hands. Go ahead, Anna. Um, well, I have one that was not mentioned yet, but um, it's not like a great strategy, but I just try to um, get some questions that I believe are gonna be asked. Because whenever I am giving a speech or a presentation at work or at school, um, I get nervous with when somebody asks me something. So I just try to anticipate before the day of the speech and make some questions that I might think are gonna be asked. Something that's, a, like. that's an excellent strategy. It's an excellent strategy for something like a job interview. I've done that in the past, right? Where you're trying to help prepare a little bit and see if you can ready a response in time. And I've also found that nothing makes you more familiar with some with content or with a subject than actually having to create questions rather than answer rather than answer something. C 
Creating questions means that you have to be completely familiar in and out with the subject material, enough so that you can ask a question and you know the answer. I can tell you that I didn't really know your textbook front and back until I actually had to write a midterm and exam about it. So it's a great way to actually get familiar with what you're talking about. Anyone else have any tips or strategies they'd like to share? I'll be right back. Okay. Well, Rodrigo, I think you might have muted your mic. I'm not sure if you're, I'm not sure if you're talking to us, but. Yeah, I am. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. My bad. I always forget. Uh, now I just try to get ca casual with the audience. You know, I try to step down from the podium, you know, and then just go down there, shake a couple hands, you know, make a little, make a couple friends. So that way I don't feel that intimidated when I start speaking, you know, I, I don't know if you could do that in a big place, but I know I do places that I usually conduct my presentations. I just, I can kind of go, you know, talk to them before I start. And, and that makes, and that makes it very way easier to, uh, to me uh, to you know conduct my presentations i also try sometimes i focus on the back wall so i don't have to look anybody in the eye <laughs> i really like I'm that just I, kidding. I, no, i'm again, just kidding i know again that works now i really like your use of language there where you step down from the podium and you see yeah. the audience as just people right they're not some right. abstract group and it's right. also really effective for engaging the audience's attention because good public speaking is trying to make a room full of people, no matter how big, still feel like they're being spoken to individually. So that means that a good public speaker can have me sitting in a crowd of 1500 people and still make me feel like he's having a conversation, he or she or ha is having a conversation with just me. Shaking someone's right. hand before a speech goes a long way towards that. It helps you right. recognize, okay, I'm not just one of the crowd. This person is speaking to me. And so I have more reason to listen to them specifically. And, and sometimes they, they do have questions about what, whatever you're going to be talking about. Uh, I remember uh, conducting uh, a quality control presentation and they, they had questions, you know, they just wanted to ask me firsthand, like, oh, what are you going to talk about? You know, like, how, how does it work? And and it just makes things easier because at that point, you already, you already started like sharing your content, you know, with the people. And I don't know, man. It's just easier exactly. for me that way. Exactly. I really like the idea of audiences asking questions. It's why I'm always asking you questions during your lectures, because during these lectures, because I find that the more of a, dis, the more of a conversation you can make between a speaker and an audience, the more it's easier for the speaker to deliver the speech because now it's actually responding to something. It doesn't feel so much like you're just talking to yourself and the audience has no more of a reason to listen. It's a little bit harder to listen to me for 50 unbroken minutes. Sorry to all the people watching us on YouTube right now. We're probably going to listen to me for 50 unbroken minutes, but it's a lot easier to sit and ask questions and respond and to always have something to give back. That's why I always recommend that the best way to stay awake during a class is to ask the teacher or professor questions, is to just involve yourself, because if you're talking to someone, it's a lot easier to actually listen. Okay, so that pretty much covers chapter two. Let me go ahead and transition to chapter three. Chapter three is going to address the other element of public speaking, which is the audience. Now, Audience analysis is a critical tool of all public speaking. Audience analysis is simply the act of understanding who is in your audience, what is your audience's perspective, what is their past experience, and where do they come from. Why do you think that audience analysis is an important skill to all public speaking? Anybody? Because without the audience, who are you going to go impress? Exactly, right? Exactly. The audience is where all public speaking is centered. Anna? Um, I guess that if you know your audience, you're going to feel more comfortable and also you're going to choose the language that you want to use accordingly. That's also a great point. We're going to get it a little bit later in this lecture, but how, the specific type of audience you have dictates which type of language you use. I try to talk to you like a class, like I try to talk to you as I would talk to anybody else. Because if I come up here 
talking like some kind of snooty professor, then you'd all get very disengaged very quickly. If I came up and went, salutations, com section 3194. Today we will be discussing the merits and demerits of audience analysis towards which the public speaker may endeavor to create a more cohesive synergistic discourse surrounding all discussion around quickly lose <laughs> track of me, right? And at the same time, does it really sound like I'm smart? No, it just sounds like I went no. out of the thesaurus and I'm trying to impress somebody, but I'm not really impressing anybody. Here's the most important less, here's the most important sentence in this class and in all of public speaking. Public speaking is audience centered. Everything you do in public speaking should be done for the audience in mind. We talked on Monday about how all public speaking is done for a purpose. That purpose is audience focus. You're trying to get the audience to listen to you. That means all that right. everything you do from the topic you select to how you write your speech, to how you say your speech, to how you deliver your speech should all be done with the audience in mind. Because if you don't keep the audience in mind, then who is this speech really for? Is it for you? I mean, you could give, your, you could give a speech to yourself in the mirror if you'd like, but the main reason why it's public speaking is because people want to listen to you. That means that with audience right. analysis, we can get as much of the legwork before our speech done as possible to make sure that the audience wants to listen to us before we've even started giving them a speech. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to skip the warm up question for today just because I think we've gotten a good discussion so far. But for audience analysis, before we can analyze our audience, first we want to identify what type of audience we're speaking to. Now we're gonna talk about five general types of audience. And by first recognizing the type of audience you have, it's gonna be a lot easier to identify how to actually construct and deliver your speech. So first we have a captive audience. Now a captive audience has to listen to a speech. They have no choice in the matter. They'll suffer some kind of penalty if they get up and leave at some point, right? That's my case. How so, Rodrigo? That's my case. It's every employee that I have, they're captive, you know. And I just wanted to add, Professor, also, it's, it's the hardest thing to me to identify what type of, you know, audience that I have. Um, I remember one of my college professors, he taught me something very valuable I just wanted to share. Uh, you want to make sure you deliver your speech, I, I, like such a good speech that I, like a five-year-old can understand what you're talking about. You don't want to get too technical because I know a lot about airplanes. I know a lot about power plants, but the person listening to me may not. Exactly. We're going to talk about, we're literally going to talk about jargon and technical terms in about six or seven slides, right? But the language we use goes a long way towards engaging our audience. And so we've identified one type of captive audience. Can anyone else give me another example of a captive audience? Can you think of a time where people would have to have no choice to listen to a speech? They have to sit there and just listen to the entirety of it? Class. Class, yeah. Rodrigo, I am offended. Yep, I was going to say that too. We don't are have you, a choice. Are you telling me that in some of my public speaking classes, people have listened to me without any choice? Yep. But they could just get up and leave in the middle of my lecture. I couldn't, I can't, I, legally I can't do anything to them, right? Right. But right. they'd suffer some kind of consequence, right? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> because with a captive audience, something to keep in mind is just because you force them to sit down and listen to you does not mean that they're actually listening to you. And take it from the experience of someone who's taught high schoolers for going on three years now. The high schooler has absolutely mastered the act of the dead-eyed stare where they're just looking at you, but there's nobody home. Where I can be giving a full 20 minute lecture and I can be looking at a class of 30 students all with this look on their face. Master of, <laughs> master of daydreaming. Exactly, right? I mean, to the point where it's, it's, it's actually kind of comical how they angle their eyes so that technically they're not asleep. Where I'll be, I'll walk over and I'll just go, hey, can you wake up? I'm not asleep, you can kind of see the lights of my eyes. <laughs> because 
yeah, I've had it, I've done it, so okay, you have no choice but to, sorry, my thing got tangled up, but okay, you have no choice but to sit there and listen. If you physically get up to leave, I'll be mad at you. But I can't guarantee your attention. I can't guarantee that you actually sit there and listen to every word I say. So too is it with your speeches. With all of your speeches, I've included a graded element that you have to watch two of your classmates' speeches and give feedback. But at the same time, I can't guarantee that you sit down and watch all of your classmates' speech. Because someone could just watch the first 30 seconds of their classmates' speech, write out their response, and that's it. So with a captive audience, you have to keep in mind that just because you have an audience doesn't mean you're guaranteed one. You have to work a little bit harder to try and keep them engaged. You have to do everything you can with how you deliver a speech, to how you construct it, to what you actually say in it, to keep the audience engaged. Interest isn't guaranteed. So next we have the committed audience. Now the committed audience usually agrees with the speaker and they already want to hear the speech before it's even given. That means that this audience knows who's speaking, they know what's going to be said, and they want to hear about it. They might have even paid to hear about it. So, can anyone give me any, any examples of a committed audience, of a group of oh. people who already want to hear a speaker? I'm going to give you an example. Uncommitted audience. I was so, how you say it? I was like, oh, I just want to tell these people. I went to UCSD and we have a speaker there. It's a meeting for all stuff or something. I see all these people. They're on the tech, they're, they're on the phone, texting. They just sit there for the heck of it. And I hate that. I mean, you guys are wasting your time and their time. Why don't you just leave this place and go about your business and don't do your business right here? Because me, I'm I like to hear the the speech, but because I see it all around me, it just oh no, I, I can deal with it. It's and that's and that's part of the reason why during my classes I ask people to put away their phones, right? Because if someone's giving a speech and five people are texting someone, I actually had someone uh, using Tinder in the front row one time, right? Then it immediately just okay, why am I paying attention? It distracts you, Stephanie. Um, yeah, so I think uh, an example of committed listeners would be, for example, when people would attend church. Um, I think they go because they want to listen to somebody speak and on top of that, a certain type of speech as well. Exactly. Now, the common thread with the committed audience is that you've already got them before you even started speaking. Because very rarely will a committed audience not know what's going to be said. Or very rarely will a committed audience need to be engaged. Because think of it this way. An example of a committed audience would be a concert, right? People paid, mm. usually an overpriced concert ticket, to go and listen to a music group. Very rarely will someone pay money to go to a concert for a band they've never heard of before. Very rarely will someone just go, yeah, I want to drop $85 to just check these people out, right? That kind of thing. They're already dedicated fans. In a lot of ways, the committed audience is the ideal for a public speaker. It's all it's what we would all like to have. We don't really have to work too hard, but at the same time we have to keep in mind that our audience is largely already going to agree with us. We're kind of preaching to the choir, so to speak there. So, we might not need to work so hard to persuade them, but at the same time we have to keep in mind, okay, what is my real purpose here? Am I really just going to get up, talk to them and convince them to do what they're already doing or to keep listening to me when they've already paid to listen? Another kind of audience is the contrary audience. Now, Anna, give your hand up. Uh, no, not anymore. I wanted to say an example of committed audience, but it's... We'll come back to that, but I just want to keep moving a little bit because we're getting a little bit close to the end of the session, okay? So, next up is the contrary audience. Now, the contrary audience are, they're kind of the opposite of the committed audience. They are there specifically to let you know that they don't agree with you, they don't want to listen to you, and maybe they want to actually heckle or stop your speech. Can anyone give me any examples of the committed audience? Political speech. Of, of a contrary audience, sorry. Of a contrary audience? 
Kind of. You said political audience, Rodrigo? Can you give us a specific yeah. example? Of well, that? there's always someone that doesn't agree and they just go there to throw some rocks and stuff, but, uh, you know. Exactly, right? This typically yeah. usually happens at the Republic Na Re Republican National Convention or the Democratic National Convention, where at, outside of the actual convention, there's going to be a group of protesters, right? Yeah. The contrary audience could be something like hecklers, like protesters, they are, if the committed audience is what we'd all like to have, the contrary audience is what a public speaker would probably fear the most. These are a group of people who objectively disagree with you so much that they want to take the time out of their day to come up and let you know about it. In a lot of ways, consider it an honor. That means that you've actually pissed off enough people to make some waves. That can have a huge effect on its own. But with the contrary audience, keep in mind that your goal there might just be, okay, you can't fully convince this group of people who abjectly disagree with you, but you maybe can get them to see the other perspective, to hear the other side. If you work hard enough with your public speech, maybe you can actually get some people to reconsider their positions, their values, their beliefs, because you've got them. They're there sitting there listening to you. Maybe you can actually get them to start actively processing what you're talking about. Right. The next kind of audience is the concerned audience. Now the concerned audience is a little bit less so of a committed audience. The concerned audience doesn't know what's being said. They don't really know who's speaking. They just know that there's something kind of interesting that they'd like to hear. And in a lot of ways, they're actively seeking it out, right? The concerned audience doesn't know what's go what you're going to talk about but they would like to learn a little bit more. They're curious. Can you give me an example of a concerned audience? Uh, maybe a book reading or a seminar, something like that. Very much so, right? Very, uh, another example would be a TED Talk. All those because of the same thing. Now, very rarely when I've actually gone to a book reading, gone to a seminar, listened to a TED Talk, did I know who the speaker was ahead of time and what they were talking about. When I click on a TED Talk, I would maybe just click on it for the title. I just say, okay, why, why sleep is rewiring my brain? Oh, that sounds interesting. I don't know who the speaker is. I don't know what the speech is about, but it was a topic that I was already a little bit drawn towards. We're gonna talk a little bit later about how topic selection helps sway that, but with a concerned audience, you have that, int you have that hook. They want to learn, you can now give them that knowledge. You can now sate their curiosity. So keep that in mind that sometimes it comes down to the topic you pick and how that appeals to the audience. If in a persuasive speech, you decide to pick the topic of why we should lower college tuition, that could help appeal a lot more to a college class. How? Because it directly affects all of us. It's a very pressing issue. <laughs> And lastly are the casual audience. The casual audience are, well, they're the audience that can come in and they can drift out. Nothing keeps them there, nothing forces, nothing is stopping them from leaving. Can you give me an example of a casual audience where- Conventions. Audience, sorry, what was that? Conventions. Conventions, right? You just walk around and maybe you can stop at a booth, maybe you can stop and listen to a speaker, but if you leave, they're not gonna chase you down, right? Any of you see any street mm -hmm. performers? Anyone performing on the street where they're juggling like 19 balls in hands or something? Balboa Park, they always have people that, um, you know, like did that, you cannot call them a, a party, you know, like, they're begging for money, but they do their own thing and then they could make money out of it. Exactly. Of exactly. Those are performers, right? Yeah. You didn't pay money to see them. You can come in, you can leave some money with them, or maybe you can just leave, right? The mm -hmm. casual audience is in a lot of ways the hardest audience to actually keep engaged because the casual audience can leave at any time. You're not even guaranteed an audience at that point. Think of how hard street performers have to work to actually draw a crowd. Think of the amazing things some of them can do. Think of just how difficult it would be to actually stand as still as a statue 
for three or four or five hours a day. And think about how little people actually still stay to watch them. That's how short our attention spans are. We can just go, we can watch someone do something absolutely amazing, like do 15 backflips without even, with just do 15 backflips, go, that's neat, and then leave and barely even remember what we just saw. With the casual audience, you have to work your absolute hardest to always keep the audience's attention, to always give them a reason to keep watching and listening. So we've talked about why it's so important to analyze our audience before delivering a speech, but analyzing our audience, actually understanding key elements and characteristics about them. What do you think are some characteristics we should take in mind when analyzing our audience? What should we learn about our audience before giving our speech? Anybody? Hmm. What do you think is some important information about our audience? Anna? Probably age. Very much so, age, okay. Because again, I could, and it just comes down to on a given day, I could be teaching 18 year olds or I could be teaching people who are working two jobs, right? Things like that, okay. Any other useful, any, any other useful characteristics? What other information would you like to learn? Some background on the people as well, if you can gather that information. Maybe, maybe some past experience with the topic, right? How many right. times they've heard the topic before. So a lot of my students, when they come with a persuasive speech, they do a speech on why you should recycle. And the first question I ask them is, okay, how many speeches have you heard on recycling in the past? And they go, well, probably like hundreds. Well, in that case, what's your, do they really need to hear one more from you? Or what can you do differently that they haven't heard a million times before? Okay, so when actually analyzing our audience, some key characteristics are their demographics, innate characteristics about your audience members. The first, of course, is your audience's gender. Keep the audience's gender in mind when both selecting your topic and with the actual language and words you use. So with gender, for example, we want to go beyond gendered stereotypes. We want to say, we want to avoid saying things like all men do this, all women do this, men do this, women do this, and so on. We want to avoid using job stereotypes according to gender, assuming that all teachers are women, that all doctors are men, and so on. We also want to avoid using what's called gendered language. So, particularly within English, a lot of our words are particularly leading towards the male gender. So, think of it this way. Have you ever heard this phrase before? All right, guys, let's get started. Yeah. Hey, you guys ever, you, what'd you guys do on the weekend? Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys, let's, come on, let's settle down. But what happens when I flip that? What happens when I go, okay, girls, let's get started? Oh, boy. Okay, girls, Good come night. on. Hey, what you girls do on the weekend? Why is that not the same? Because you might have guys in the, the audience. But then why when I say you guys, when there's women in the audience, why doesn't that sound, why doesn't that trip, why doesn't that set off any tripwires? Why doesn't anyone just go, what? Why, is he, why does he just keep saying guys? It's understandable that guys mean unisex. But it's not. Guys is... The guys is inherently male. Now, you're right, Lou, in that we kind of assume that it means unisex. That doesn't mean that it has to be. With gendered language, we want to tie and take a little bit of a look at the specific words we use and ask ourselves, okay, everyone talks like this, but do we have to keep talking like this? Because if I keep using you guys without any real consideration for what my audience is actually made up of, then it's just going, then I'm just going to keep excluding at least half of my audience. Because in just this Zoom call alone, Rodrigo, sorry to call you out, but the only guys in this Zoom call are me and Rodrigo. So the majority of this class are women. If I keep using you guys, then I'm excluding at least 80% of the people that I'm talking to. I'm already, when I say you guys, I'm saying, okay, two people in this Zoom call, the rest can go tune out or can go tab to another window. Sometimes it can be as small as just picking the individual words we use. 
by instead of saying you guys, try using something a little bit more inclusive. By saying something like, a word I like to use is y'all. I like to say you all. All right, y'all, let's get started. I like y'all. Y'all <laughs> makes me feel a little bit more relaxed, a little more casual, a little bit more comfortable. If you want me to get formal, I can say you all. All right, you all, let's get started. But That's a slang word, professor. Y'all? Yes. What's wrong with slang? Nothing, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's a slang word, but again, it doesn't exclude anybody, right? right. It's, 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 it's actually not a slang, it's just an abbreviation. Exactly. Um, Y'all doesn't exclude anybody. Yeah, it's a little bit less professional, but public speaking is not always sounding super formal. Because now I can include my entire audience just through the use of the word y'all. And because it's not so familiar a term, now the members of my audience who aren't included by something like you guys can go, okay, he took me into consideration. He took his audience's gender into consideration even with just the specific words he used. And last point about words, how we, the more we can control the individual words we use, the less of what we say becomes an unconscious reflex and more a deliberate choice, the easier it's going to be to actually control our speech while giving it. So all of these skills help work both to improving our own public speaking and to help keeping our audience engaged and to create and towards creating a more equal society for everybody. And that leads to culture and ethnicity. We want to keep the audience's culture into consideration when constructing our speech. Because what we want to avoid doing is something called ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is the belief that our culture, the culture we were born into, is automatically the default or the correct culture. That if I believe this because I was born in the US, that therefore everyone should. And people who don't are a little bit weird or just haven't figured it out yet, right? You wanna keep that in mind because everyone has a different perspective. Everyone has a different background. There are something like 10 people in this Zoom call. There are 10 different perspectives to consider. Keep that in mind that just because you necessarily believe something doesn't mean that everyone shares that belief. And if someone has a different background, or a different culture than you, that doesn't mean that they believe something differently or that they believe something wrong. It's just that they have a different perspective. So by keeping that in mind, we can first avoid offending anybody. We can avoid infringing on anybody's culture and beliefs. And we can also take into consideration how we want to approach our topic. If, my, if I have an audience of people who aren't necessarily as familiar with American culture, then I need to reframe how I talk about certain things. We'll get into jargon and technical terms a little bit later, but you always want to keep the audience's culture and ethnicity in mind. For your speeches in this class in particular, we're a very diverse classroom. We come from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different cultures. You want to keep that in mind for your speech. Don't assume that everyone's so familiar with something. And at the same time, keep in mind that maybe we can show someone our own personal background and perspective, our own culture. So, when we actually want to analyze our audience, we want to connect with them. We want, to, we want them to want to listen to us. How we do that, how we connect with our audience, is we get them to like us. By improving our likability and our reliability, we're actually able to have them want to continue to listen, not just to us, but to our speech. That's why, and I'm probably failing at this, but that's why I try to tell jokes. That's why I try to use a more expressive voice when talking to you. That's why I try to use my hands a lot when I'm actually talking, even though I'm a little screen on the right side of your computer. Because the more I try to get you to like me, the more likely it's going to be that you can listen to my lectures because no one wants to just listen to someone drone on. That's why I want to even have these lectures in, a, in the first place. Because I, yeah, this entire eight week online course could be delivered entirely through me sending you a weekly email, but there's no connection there. You have nothing that you actually want to relate to in the content of your speech. You also want to establish common ground with your audience, just getting them to agree with something. Because if you can get them to see, okay, this person has this in common with the speaker, I have this in common with the person who's talking, that improves that likability. 
You also want to dress the part. You don't want to wear anything overly inappropriate, anything super unprofessional, because it's a lot harder for the audience to see you as confident and credible in that instance. So establishing our speaker credibility, again, we want to appear competent, we want to appear confident. Both of those are brought through just regular practice of public speaking. We also want to demonstrate dynamism. We want to be energetic. We want to sound like we really care about what we're talking about, like there's life and energy in our speech, because no one likes to listen to a monotone. We always got to vary it up with the voice we're using, with the gestures we're using, just even with what we're talking about. And now we come to topic selection. So some key things to keep in mind when actually selecting our topic when, for example, for our upcoming speeches is that number one, like I talked about on Monday, we have to be passionate about it. The more passionate you are about a topic, it becomes infinitely easier to actually write an outline for it and to deliver a speech. Because if you're picking something just because you feel like it's easy or because it's something you're familiar with but don't necessarily care about, then it's always gonna feel like a struggle. It's always gonna feel like pulling teeth just to sit down and write something about it. But if you want to write about it, if you want to talk about it, then it's so much fun to become invested in your own speech. One of the great, one of the best parts of Comms 103 is that very rarely, if ever, will I objectively say, you have to talk about this topic. You need to give a speech on this topic. I give you enormous freedom in what you choose to talk about. So always try to ask yourself, what are you genuinely interested? What in, do you want to learn more about? What would you like to teach the audience about? And so on. You can also solicit ideas from different sources. You can ask your classmates, hey, what are you doing for your speech? Oh, and you can ask me as well. Hey, I was thinking about doing this topic, this topic, and this topic. Odds are I probably know something about it just because I've heard so many topics on so many different speeches. And hopefully I can give you a little bit of feedback on it and so on. You also want to make sure your speech topic is appropriate, both for yourself and your audience. Now, an appropriate topic is something that is appropriate to the specific occasion, to the specific audience, and to the specific purpose. That means, okay, so if you're giving me a persuasive speech and you're talking about something inappropriate, if you're trying to tell me something that is morally unethical, that's inappropriate. If you try to give a topic on something you don't personally believe or that you're not invested in, that's not appropriate for you. And if you give a topic that's going to offend the audience, that's not really appropriate for them either. So, uh, we're not gonna do the breakfast activity. So, that pretty much covers chapter three. Why we need to keep our audience type into consideration, some specific aspects of our audience we should be considering, and how to actually select our topic for our speech. So that covers chapters two and three. That pretty much closes our lectures for today. Does anyone have any questions at all before we head out, either on the course, on the lectures I just gave, or on your activity due on Friday? Anna? Yeah, I have a quick question about the uh, videos that we have to upload for the speeches. Is there a specific angle that you want us to use? Like, do you want to see only our face or the entire body to kind of... You can use any angle you like. We're going to talk more about what you're actually going to grade it on for your major speeches. I okay. would recommend putting the camera a little bit further back from you, just so that we can see at least your hands and your upper body. Right. If there's just one camera angle I don't want you to be using, is just don't do this. Don't do what my high schoolers do. Don't go like this, okay? Don't no. just like, I don't, I, I'm sure you have a great chin. I'm sure you all have great chins. I'd like to see a little bit more than that, right? Okay. Okay. But other than that, for the activities, I'm not really grading for that or anything like that. I just, just finish, just do the prompt basically, and then respond to two of your peers. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, professor. Any other have questions? All right, well, if you have any other questions, feel free to come by my office hours. I'll be holding tomorrow from 2 to 3 p.m. The Zoom link is on Canvas. So thank you all for stopping in today. I, I 
I, I gotta say, you're all fantastic with carrying a discussion. I love lecturing people who actually talk and not just, uh, but I could complain about high school classes all day. But, <laughs> all right. so if you have any questions, reach me via email or stop at my office hours. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday and I hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you all on Monday. Thanks, Later. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor.